Amen, amen. Thank God for the power of the Spirit in our lives. It's what's going to get us out of here, folks. It's what's going to keep us while we're here. But it's going to get us out of here. That's the most important thing. Amen. God bless you. Remain standing. Get your Bibles. Brother Brian William has been on the schedule for some time tonight. We enjoy our ministry, local ministry, when they preach. Let's give attention to the Word and soak up whatever God has for us. Give the Lord a hand clap as He comes. Well, praise the Lord, church. Are you excited to be alive and in the house of God? Amen. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited to be alive. Praise God. After having COVID, you'll be excited to make it back into the house of God. Amen. That was the worst sickness I ever had in my life, and I don't want it again. And I'm excited to be alive. The Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. So if you're here tonight, you're blessed. Amen? Amen. Praise God. If you'll turn to your Bibles and turn to Revelations 3 and 20. Chapter 3 and verse 20. Elijah learned this scripture not too long ago in children's church. And uh, that and memorized a whole bunch of other scriptures as well. And uh, <laughs> he was praying one night by himself in his room and he come down and he says, Dad, he says, I was praying and I heard a knock. <laughs> and uh, he said, I turned around and nothing was there. And he said, I started praying again. And he said, I heard something knock again. And he said, I turned around. And he said, it was distracting. And he said, I turned around and rebuked the devil in Jesus' name. And I said, that's good. I said, but are you sure it was the devil? You know, and uh, I actually sent Pastor that video of him praying. And uh I told him, I said, honestly, you were praying and, and you've been quoting that scripture. And he quoted that scripture that night. And I said, that might have been God reaching out to you. That might have been spiritual knock while you were praying. Amen. That was a night that I thought he was going to get the Holy Ghost. I was secretly on the outside of the, the room listening. And um, that's probably what the knock was. Amen. Stumbling around, not a kid no more. Praise God. Um, I'd like to give Pastor honor tonight and for the opportunity to be in front of you folks and Give honor to my family, my wife, and my kids. Amen? Amen. Revelations 3 and 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. And verse 21 says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and sat down with my father in his throne. Praise God. If I had to put a title on my message tonight, I would, I would title it this way. Will you answer the knock? Amen. Let's pray, church. Mighty God, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, God, to stand in your presence, almighty God, to sing praise unto you, King Jesus. Lord, we pray tonight, God, that you would bless this message. Lord, speak to our hearts, God. Speak to our minds, oh God, and wash us right by your word. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory, all the honor, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your hand of mercy, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. And you may be seated. Praise God. In this passage of Scripture, we see John writing to one of the seven churches that was started in the beginning of the New Testament under Paul, or one of his disciples. This particular church that John was writing to was the church of Laodicea. Not only do we see this church of Laodicea spoken of in Revelations, but we also see it again in Colossians. Chapter 4 and chapter 2. If you have your Bibles and you can turn, you can turn to Colossians chapter 4, and I think it's verse 16. And Paul is writing to the Colossians, and he says, make sure that you read this letter in front of the church of Laodicea, and likewise, any letters from Laodicea read to Colossians. And in Colossians 2 and 5 through 7, if you'll turn, it says, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and your steadfastness in your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. 
Paul was writing to the church, and he said, I am thankful, and he expressed his excitement about knowing and hearing about their great faith and about them being rooted in sound doctrine, being crucified, being circumcised with Christ and buried with him in baptism. A church that pleased Paul, but not only Paul, it pleased God. A church that prayed and walked in the Spirit. A church that could hear God's voice. A church that obeyed God's word. We then see the same church of Laodicea mentioned again in Revelations chapter 3. This time it is in a different perspective. Turning to Revelations chapter 3 and verse 14. And we'll read down through 19. It says, And the angel of the church, talking about the pastor, of the Laodiceans, Laodicedans, I probably pronounced that wrong, write these things, says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold and that you were hot, so then because you are lukewarm, you are neither hot nor cold. I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and I have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. From Colossians to Revelations, something dramatically changed in this church of Laodicea. What was it? We see now that in Revelations, they are neither on fire for God, neither are they cold. Which God describes as being lukewarm. God is telling them, because you are neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Being cold would be completely in sin, living out of the church. Being hot would be on fire for God, completely in the church. But where these folks were was they had one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They wanted the wealth and the lustful things that please the flesh, but they also wanted to stay in the ground of safety with God. Amen? They were sitting on the fence with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Like some of us today, we work from sun up to sundown. Our prayer lives go from an hour a day to maybe five minutes lay me down to sleep prayers with our babies at night. We start off working a five-day-a-week job, off on Wednesdays and Sundays, to working every day of the week and replacing our time with God to the, and building a church to our wealth and fulfilling our lust in the world and putting God on the back burner. The Laodicedans used the art of banking and trading like the Romans to start making their wealth. They were living in a world and enjoying the pleasures of sin with one foot in the church and the other out. They wanted the best of both worlds. Amen. They knew what it was like to be on fire for God, but they also knew what it was like to feel the lust of their flesh. Amen. God said, you will either love me or love the world, but you can't do both. Luke 16 and 13 says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I believe that the church of Laodicea was doing this exact thing. They were trying to serve two masters, both God and mammon. I also believe that Paul knew this was going to be a problem for them for where they were at. They were positioned in an environment with many Roman influences. It says in Colossians 2, 1 through 4, it says, For I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as I has for as many has not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge and the mystery of God both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say unto you, at the very, very last part of that little verse there, he says, be not deceived with persuasive words. He began to warn this church from the very beginning. 
Be careful who you're around. Be careful that you keep everything in subjection that you were saved from. He was warning them, do not be deceived by the persuasive words by the ones around you. The church of Laodicea was surrounded by Roman persuasion and influence. In that area, they were surrounded by trading, banking, and some even say medications for the eyes and joints. They bought, they sold goods. Paul said, be careful of the ones around you that you be not deceived. They were gaining wealth and enjoying the pleasures of sin. Paul then said in Colossians 3 and 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Paul said, you have to be careful. And they begin to entertain the things that they were saved from from the beginning. Paul was saying, in order to stay faithful to Christ, you must keep these members of your body under control from the things you used to be. Amen? You have to make sure that you keep the old things buried or they will begin to consume you once more. Most of us were bought and brought out of a world of sin and the other half of us was raised in church. I was bought and brought out of a world of sin. I was raised as a child in, in church very young, and then I was pulled out at very young, five, six years old. So to me, church was nothing that I really knew. Amen? So God saved me from the world that I was in. So sitting here tonight, I have to be careful that I don't let the things that used to destroy me begin to creep back up again. Amen? We're a church of sound doctrine, but if you're not careful, the world will begin to creep in again through some avenue that the devil has placed in your life. Amen. We have to be careful to keep these things under subjection. He said, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which yourselves once walked and lived in them. Reading in Colossians, we see that we were saved from these things. And then in Revelations, it consumed them again. But, only difference, but the only difference this time is they were sitting on the fence. When Paul began to write to them, they were on fire for God. When we see them again in Revelations, they're cold, technically. They think they're lukewarm. God begins to talk about they're lukewarm. But they were sitting in the middle. They were coming to church. They were here, but they weren't here. Amen? Have you ever been sitting in church and your mind just began to wonder about something else outside those doors? That's where they were. Amen? He said, God was knocking at, his, at their door. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined, refined in the fire that you may be rich with white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. God said, even though you think you're clothed in fine linen, you're naked. Amen? And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke. Therefore, be zealous and repent. These things you are storing are not spiritual, nor are they everlasting. The things in the world will not last forever. And that's what God was saying. Buy from me. Buy something from me that will last eternal. Amen? He begins to talk about this thing. We go out and we buy cars and we buy houses and we build houses and we build this wealth. That's what the, that's what the church was doing. They thought that they was in need of anything. They were self-sufficient. They thought they didn't need God no more. But to me, they knew they knew they needed God, but they wanted to keep that foot in the door because they felt safe, amen? But in reality, they were not. They were sinking fast. God was saying, if you will just hear my voice, open the door and repent, I will come back in and sup with you and you with me. I will make you rich with gold tried in fire and give you garments whiter than snow to cover the nakedness of this world. God was knocking, wanting to come in, just like he was knocking, and the time is running short, just like God's knocking now. At one point in time, we all have been on the other side of that door when a knock has come through, a physical knock. And I know we've all been home when someone's knocked at our door, and we ran to the peephole, and we looked out to see who it was, right? Amen? Maybe someone was knocking and you ran behind the couch or 
you dove over the couch like MacGyver or something like that because you didn't want them peeking through the window and seeing where you really were. Amen? We've all been there. Come on now. Y'all laugh, but it's the truth. I ain't the only one that's hid behind the door when there was a knock. I mean, Jehovah Witnesses, they come all the time, and I hide from them. Amen? Praise God. And then we have solicitors now walking around trying to sell us security systems, and I hide from those guys too. Matter of fact, they see you pull into the neighborhood, so I'll ride around four or five times so they won't see what house I'm at, right? Praise God. We've all been there. But we also do that with God. When God's knocking, we hide behind the door. Some, we hide behind the door because we don't want our hearts being revealed to God. Amen? We're treating God the way we have treated others when he's knocking. Maybe you are praying for a miracle but not answering the door. Maybe you're praying for a new job but hiding because you don't want your heart revealed. I believe that the church of Laodicea was doing the same thing in the generation that we live in now. We are living in that time that God could come back at any moment. And we don't want to miss him coming. But there are those that are enjoying the pleasures of sin. So they have a foot in the church and they have a foot in the world. Amen? And because they are enjoying the lust and sinful nature, they are lukewarm. Right? We're sitting here. We're lukewarm. If we're playing with God, basically that's what they were doing. They were playing with God. They were playing in the world and they were playing in the church. Amen? Amen? Afraid that they were going to miss heaven, but refused to take their foot out. God said, I can't do anything with you because you're lukewarm. Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I need of nothing. I can't do anything with you. You are useless. They all thought that they were rich with nice homes, clothes, food, joy. God called them out. You are none of these things. Instead, you are rich, but you are poor. Instead, you are clothed with nakedness. Instead, you are rich and poor in the things in the world. You will fade away. You will rot with those things in the world. You're happy in your season of sin, but miserable in the next. In Revelations 1 and verse 12 through 13, John writes about what he saw. Then I turned to the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, which was Jesus. The candlesticks represents the church, amen? Clothed in a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a gold band. John was describing the seven churches that he saw and Jesus right in the middle of them. If he saw those churches in Revelations and they were talked about in the New Testament, those churches are still living today, amen? If we're not careful, we'll end up with the Laodicedans where they ended up in the lukewarmness with God, amen? Because we're not bringing back the altars. We're not heeding to sound doctrine. And Paul warned them of this. Paul warned them of this. And John seen him, Jesus standing right in the midst. Revelations 3 and 20 wasn't written for the unbelieving and the sinners. But it was written for the church that has fallen short of his glory. It was for the churches. It was for the churches. Amen. Instead, we should be having revival. But God said you're lukewarm because you won't take your foot out of the world, but neither will you take your foot out of the church. Praise God, you're useless, is what he was saying. You're useless. Praise God. We got to learn to bring back those altars. We got to learn to rebuild them. Take our minds out of the world when we're sitting in the house of God. Let our minds begin to be spiritual. Let them. Begin to think about lost souls and revival, not about our jobs outside those doors and what we're going to do when we get home or for some of us, what we're going to eat when we leave the church. Amen. Praise God. I'm guilty of that. Sometimes my stomach could be growling. I'll be sitting here and pastor will be preaching and I'll be thinking about some chips and dip. Amen. I'm sorry. But that's what God was saying. You're in the church, but you're also in the world. And your mind is not on my things. They become so self-sufficient that they push God out and shut the door with God on the outside. They became rich in the world and felt they didn't need God anymore. And he became the last thing on their minds. They served the world and despised God. Just like the world today, consumed by everything around them, they can't hear the voice of God. You know why the churches aren't having revival in the greatest hour to be living in? Because they've locked the door on God. 
They've allowed the world in and everything else to persuade them. They've pushed sound doctrine out and they've allowed false teaching in. We have pushed out the spirit of God and allowed the flesh to rule again. 2 Timothy 4 and 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will run their eyes, and they will turn their eyes away from the truth, and they will be turned aside to fables. God was saying, you're hot and cold, and you're going to be led by every doctrine of the world, except for sound doctrine inside the church. Peter said in 1, 5 through 9, he says, But as for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound in you, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. That's what it was saying in Revelations. They had forgotten where they had come from, and they had let the world consume them. Peter said, if you have the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, godliness, and love, you are a healthy church. But if you lack these things, you are blind and have forgotten everything that God has saved you from. Brother Marcus, you can... Come to the music and singers if you want to come. In Hebrews 3 and 12 through 19, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart or unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ." If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, it says, while it's while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. This knock in Revelations was not a physical knock. Behold, I stand to the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. He didn't knock. He said, hear my voice and open the door. I will come into him. And will sup with him and him with me. The reason this passage of scripture is for the church and not for sinners is because it is a spiritual knock. It is a calling from God where the church has locked him out. And he's saying, if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Amen. He said, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will heal your heart. Amen. If you open the door, I'll give you peace again because you're miserable. If you open the door, I'll clothe you where you're naked and left by the world. Amen. Some of us have left the world and we come in the church and God said, but if you hear my voice right here, if you hear my voice, I can replace every one of those friends with brothers. Amen. And sisters in Christ. He's saying, listen for my voice. Let us not become so spiritually dead that we can't hear the voice of God. Praise God. Praise God. Where have the altars gone where we plead with God to hear His voice? Where has the prayers gone for the anointing of God to fall down in this place? Praise God. When have we touched the horns of His altar and pleaded the blood over our family? When's the last time that we truly heard His voice? Praise God. Let us not shut the door on God, but let us open it where His voice is flowing through us again. Where we can have a relationship with God again. Praise God. Praise God. Church, I love you. But if you can hear the voice of God, open the door and let Him back in. He'll handle any situation. He'll heal any disease. He'll mend the brokenhearted again. Praise God. Praise God, don't be like this church in Revelations that's sitting in lukewarmness, sitting in lukewarmness. Don't let your foot be in the church, but your desires in the world. Praise God, we got to get on fire for God again. Amen. I love you, church. Appreciate you.